President Roosevelt famously said that December 7, 1941 was a date that would live in infamy. Japan launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, killing over 2,400 Americans. Less than three months later, the president signed an executive order allowing everyone of Japanese descent, including American citizens, to be forcibly evacuated from the West Coast. About 120,000 people were rounded up and taken to camps in remote areas of the country for the rest of the war. Most of them lost their homes, their farms, pretty much everything. Richard Reeves is an award-winning journalist and author. He's written about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II in a book called Infamy. Richard, welcome to the program. Thank you. The attack on Pearl Harbor shocked everybody. Yes. What was the mood in the Japanese American community? Well, they were terrified. I mean, they, they realized that something might happen and in within 48 hours uh, in California alone, more than 3,000 were rounded up. Literally, either soldiers or FBI agents came and took anyone of prominence, teachers, priests, uh, businessmen. Community uh, leaders. The community leaders. It was like they took the Rotary Club. It wasn't a very sophisticated list. But in the homes of Japanese people, Japanese American people, they began immediately to burn anything or bury anything that was written in Japanese. If they had music, they broke the records, uh, burned them. The girls' dolls in kimonos and whatnot were buried or thrown in to the fire books, and particularly Bibles, many of them were Christians, and knitting manuals. Knitting manuals were considered to be code books by the FBI. So, so even before Pearl Harbor, there was anti-Japanese sentiment tremendous. in the United well, States. Well, from 1924 on until 1952, Japanese could not become citizens. Why not? Because they were not white. There was a 1790 law saying that America is open uh, to white people of substance. And so that so this included all Asians, yeah. the Chinese, the Koreans. Well, it changed. first it was the Chinese when they came to build uh, the railroads, then the Japanese came later, uh, and then came in 1924, the Oriental Exclusion Act. And for the Chinese, it ended in the 1940s because they were allies in World War II. For the Japanese, they could not, be, their children were citizens. Because they were born Two here. Two-thirds, they were born here but the immigrants could not become citizens. They could not become naturalized. So the fear was that Pearl Harbor was just the beginning, that Japan was gonna launch uh, an invasion of, of the West Coast. Yes. Um, and or at least the press kept saying that. The Japanese did not have the capability to do that. And the people the, the, in Washington knew that. They did know that, that this yeah. was never gonna happen. That it was not gonna happen. So why was it that there was this, um, they were whipping up this hysteria. If, if the, the intelligence services, the military knew it couldn't happen, Washington knew it couldn't happen, why did they allow, was it the press that, that did all this? The press was the first driver of it. For about two weeks, the, the papers in California, national radio and whatnot talked about tolerance and the American way and we're all citizens. Eleanor Roosevelt had a lot to say about that. But within a couple of weeks, the racism, the fear, which was very real, and the real greed. The Japanese at that time produced 40% of the agricultural product of California, and the white farmers wanted that land, and they got it, because when the Japanese bank accounts were frozen, they were moved into con in, first into assembly centers, racetracks, and livestock pavilions. They lived in stables for months, a lot of sickness. And at the same time, they built, from prisoner of war camp plans, they built 10 called relocation centers around the West and in Arkansas. Terrible places where people had never lived. But what were they saying that these Japanese immigrants or Japanese Americans were going to do to us? What were they afraid of? Well, they were from afraid, them? the word then was fifth column. In the, in the war in Spain uh, between the Republicans and the fascists, 
a Spanish general said that they would win uh, because they had a fifth column of people who would do sabotage and whatnot when the war began. So that was very much in fashion, and that was promoted then by the press, by the Los Angeles Times, the Hearst Papers, Walter Lippmann, who was the most powerful columnist in the country, Dr. Seuss, who was then a columnist for uh, PM in New York, was drawing cartoons of the Japanese piling up dynamite to use and looking to Tokyo uh, for signals when to use it. And most of all, the army, a general named De DeWitt, and the Attorney General of California, who was Earl Warren. I want to go back to the, the, the fear and the hysteria. They were saying essentially that these Japanese, no matter, even if they were born here, even if they were raised here, they could never be loyal to the United States. They would always be loyal what to Japan. What they said was a Jap, this is General DeWitt, a Jap is a Jap, you can't tell them apart. Uh, so there's no way we can tell who's loyal and who's not. But did we say that about Italian Americans? Did we say that about German no. Americans? No, and I mean, why? Because there are 120,000 Japanese. If we did the same things to the Italians and the Germans in World War II, one drop of blood, which was the standard, we would have had to build camps for 50 million people because almost everybody in America has some German blood or some Italian uh, blood in them. No, the Japanese were the low-hanging fruit, and they were prosperous and hardworking. The kids... Kids were thrown out of school the next day, both colleges and four-year-olds. They, sc they scoured the orphanages to find out if any of the kids there had uh, Japanese blood, and they compiled lists of Caucasians who had adopted Japanese children, and they took those children and put them in the camps. And people dying in hospitals, soldiers were assigned around the clock to a room until those folks died or they were healthy enough to be moved in a sealed train to a camp. But I can't imagine this just happening right at Pearl Harbor. Was there preparations being made? No. For, for well, any of this? I mean, were they thinking, you know what, if anything happens, we can round up these people, we need to evacuate them? The FBI had lists, the list of the 3,000 leaders. Also, they had lists of members of the German-American Bund in New York and of some Italian organizations, people like Ezio Pinza, who was the, the lead basso of the Metropolitan Opera and later the star of uh, South Pacific, had lived in America for 20 years. Uh, but he was rounded up, he was put in uh, solitary for five months and had a nervous breakdown, and he'd still be there if Theodore LaGuardia, whose parents were also uh, unnaturalized aliens, uh, had not gotten him out of that cell. So it was, there was a short period in which the FBI, with a certain amount of competence, not a great deal, uh, had these lists. Those people, all men, all aliens, not citizens, uh, were taken to prisons. Sometimes their families didn't hear from them for two or three years. And no one was ever charged with anything. Earl Warren's role yeah, let's talk about Earl Warren. He, he, had, Earl, he became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Yes, and he became Governor of California on the backs of the Japanese. Uh, but his theory, a Jap is a Jap, was that the fact that there had never been a single incident of Japanese-American sabotage, either here or in Hawaii, where there were many more Japanese-Americans, was proof that they were waiting for signals from Tokyo to plan a major offensive on American soil. Which it doesn't was all even make fantasy. sense. Well, it didn't make sense. People were reporting people all over. One of the big uh, roundups in Northern California came uh, because someone called in the FBI and said that there were Japanese admirals all hidden in this one neighborhood. And the FBI rushed in, and it was a Masonic Club meeting where the people were wearing fancy hats and that kind of thing. Caucasian people at that. No, not much of it was rational. And the president and other people, we had, the well, Navy had uh, taken safe crackers out of San Quentin to break into Japanese consulates to see what they thought. So on the president's desk was the reports of those break-ins. And what those papers said was, we can't trust 
the American Japanese. They're because they're loyal patriotic, to America. Fiercely patriotic. So who's, whose idea was this? Where, where did this <laughs> idea of evacuating the entire West Coast come from? Was it General DeWitt from it the Army? It was General John DeWitt, who was the 62-year-old, not very competent, racist, stupid, commander of the Fourth Army. His deputy was Joseph Stilwell, Vinegar Joe Stinwell, who became a hero in the war, who had also sent reports saying DeWitt is an old man, a doddering old man, he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's reacting to pressure from economic interests and, and politicians in California who want these people out. Maybe they're doddering old men, but FDR, how, who convinced him to sign that order? Well, he signed it 24 hours after Walter Lippmann wrote his columns saying that we had to, uh, we had to imprison these people. Obviously, Roosevelt was a racist and also believed in eugenics. He believed, and he was getting this information from the Smithsonian, that the reason the Japanese were aggressive was the shape of their skulls and that it would take 2,000 years for them to reach the level of white people. Well, as we know, that was hardly true. But people were different then uh, than, they, uh, than they are now. And also, obviously, the man had a lot on his mind. There was pressure coming from California, pressure coming from the press. All right, let's do it. They found a lawyer who could figure out a way, John McCloy, Deputy Secretary of War, who could find a way that they could issue these orders without mentioning race. So what they did was create military zones and say the army had the right to move any people out of those zones. Well, the only people they moved out were Japanese Americans. I was gonna ask you about the legality. How do you take an American citizen, imprison him or her, um, and children without due process? Well, as John McCloy said, uh, I'm a Wall Street jo uh, lawyer. The Constitution is just a scrap of paper to me. It was all unconstitutional. By the way, those laws are all still on the books. We could do it tomorrow to Muslims or to border crossers. The, although the Japanese four cases that got to the Supreme Court and were not decided until after the 1944 election on Roosevelt's orders, uh, they were acquitted as it were. They won their cases, but the law itself was not changed. And as Justice Jackson said, Robert Jackson said at the time, this is laying on America like a loaded gun that can be picked up any time. And it could be picked up tomorrow. Let's talk about the logistics. Right. Once FDR signed the executive order, um, how long did people have to get their affairs in order? What, I mean, did people come and, and snatch them? What, what, what happened? What happened was that they posted neighborhood after neighborhood on the West Coast, in Oregon and Washington as well, uh, posters saying that all people of Japanese blood must assemble at this point, at this time, in 48 hours, or, and you can only bring all you can carry, which meant two suitcases or a suitcase and a baby. There was no or because there was no resistance. The Japanese felt it was their, the Japanese Americans, felt it was their patriotic duty. There was no, uh, there were no demonstrations, there was no resistance. The Japanese patiently, Just gracefully, politely appeared wherever they were told to. This corner of San Francisco, that corner of Los Angeles or San Diego, they were put on buses and taken to temporary holding centers, racetracks, livestock pavilions, and they lived in stables uh, for three or four months while tar paper barracks based on prisoner of war camp plans were built in the West and in Arkansas. You mentioned their um, uh, bank accounts were frozen. They were frozen. So what happened, you know, if you owned a house or if you owned a farm or if you owned a business, what, what do you do? If your neighbors, white neighbors, were your friends, and were decent people. They watched over your property. They gave you the profits from these very profitable farms and fishing uh, boats and whatnot. That was rare 
but it did happen. Otherwise, the property was declared abandoned, and the state of California, under the sheet laws, uh, took the property and distributed it among the neighbors. Because you couldn't even continue to pay your mortgage. There was no way to pay it. There were some people, you know, business leaders and that kind of person who had staffs and things like that of Caucasians uh, who could handle their affairs. But most of these people were farmers and fishermen, and even if they were successful, they had no sophistication uh, to deal with the government, which had taken away their leadership. The FBI took the leadership to prisons, and these people, women and children, were pretty much left on their own. So what were the conditions in the camp? What, what was daily life like there? Well, it was held at the beginning. There were tar paper barracks, not wood, <coughs> uh, tar paper, six people living in a 12 by 18 foot space, the latrines outside, no cooking facilities, no water, one electric light bulb per barracks. In parts of the country, in Northern California, Wyoming, Idaho, Arizona, where the summer temperatures were above 120 degrees and the winter temperatures were below 30 below. And the, many of the camps were built on what had been in times long past, either lava beds or <coughs> uh, lakes, including the Owens Lake, which is where the water it's in the movie Chinatown was moved to Los Angeles. Uh, so there were constant dust storms in these high deserts, which would blow right through. There'd be an inch, two inches of sand every morning. The parents would dig holes under the barracks and put their children in during the day because it would be cooler. Now, these were very capable people, many of them, and they built these camps into small American towns full of baseball leagues, and Boy Scout they troops, did it themselves. proms, they did it themselves. Many of the kids liked it. They were free. They could run wild. But it was like a Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland scene. These kids were Americans. The people on both sides of the barbed wires were Americans, and the Japanese were told they were being put there for their own protection. But of course, when they got there, they noticed the machine guns and the towers and the searchlights were pointed in, not out. And they were prisoners. They were concentration camps, which is what they were called. Because if you tried to leave, if you just uh, like, no, thank you, I'm going to go no. home now, you'd get shot. Some got shot. A couple of Some dozen. Some did get yeah, shot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In one of the more famous cases, a, a Japanese man, an elderly man, you know, you had these soldiers there guarding them. They were bored out of their minds in the middle of the desert, and they were looking for some action. So there comes a day when this man, who's deaf, is walking along the wire, and a soldier, American soldier, shouts at him to get away from that wire. The man doesn't answer. He doesn't hear. The uh, soldier shoots him in the back and kills him. Soldier is court-martialed, found guilty, and his penalty is a $1 fine for misuse of government property, the bullet. So it was not a very pleasant life, although they did their best to make it a community. What about and, many, and then there came a time when their sons began uh, to volunteer for the military. What about tensions within the camp? They because <coughs> you have all kinds of different people that are not used right. to living together. You might have professionals and farmers living together. You might have um, you know, Japanese immigrants, people that don't even speak Japanese right. in the camps Almost living together. Almost all people didn't speak. Japanese, and there was a generational divide. Only the older people really spoke Japanese well. But there were all kinds of people thrown together, artists and lawyers, uh, illiterate uh, farmers uh, and whatnot. There was a lot of tension, but the greatest tension was organized by Japanese-American veterans of World War I. People who had been American soldiers in World War I were in the camps, and most of the Japanese were amazingly not bitter. They thought they were doing their duty. But the guys who had been soldiers in World War I, who had worn the uniform, organized things called Black Dragon Societies and whatnot, which did try to disrupt the camps. And there were times when soldiers had to come in, when tanks had to come in uh, to, to put down 
uh, rebellions of people who had been thrown into stockades. So now the army <coughs> starts recruiting soldiers right. from the we camps. Need people. We need people. So how do we go from, we don't trust you, you're disloyal to us, and you're dangerous, to can you help us win the war? The first 30,000 Japanese Americans served in Europe, 18,000 of them were casualties. 6,000, it was total secret, no one ever knew that 6,000 Japanese Americans were fighting in the Pacific as translators, interrogators, and cave flushers. They, because the Imperial Japanese soldiers were trained not to surrender, and they would hide in places like Okinawa in caves. And these young Japanese Americans would go in there and talk them out. Without, they had no weapons. The Japanese had weapons, Japanese Imperial. Our kids had no weapons. They went and talked them out. But the divides in the Japanese community turned out they were trained, uh, the 442nd reg Combat Regimental Team, which became the most decorated unit in American history. Uh, 18 medals of honor, including Daniel Inouye, who became, senator. lost an arm in Italy and became a senator. Uh, but he was a Hawaiian. The Hawaiians and the American Japanese hated each other. The Hawaiians were a wild bunch. They were darker skinned because they were farm workers, uh, and they drank, they gambled, and they just raised hell. And the Americans were all educated, Stanford, Berkeley, USC, and they were sending every penny they had back to their families in the camps. There were fights all the time between these two groups, and the army was going to give up on it, and a colonel uh, loaded busloads of the Hawaiians and took them from Mississippi to Arkansas to see the parents of the guys they were fighting with. Uh, and when they came back, their leader, who was Dan Inouye, who was a sergeant, assembled the Hawaiians, Japanese, and said, listen, these people are fighting uh, for their country when their parents are being held prisoner by just their that, country. Just that yeah. concept, Richard. Yeah. That that your son is fighting and you're in prison. Right. Because America doesn't trust you. Yeah. And you're and supposed in to be those prisons, in the camps and whatnot, were what we all saw in those days: the gold stars and the blue stars on a red, white, uh, red and white field. That you had a son or two sons or daughters uh, in the military. How did this decision come about to close the camps? Within two years, they knew it was a disaster. I mean, everything was going wrong. They knew uh, that because resistance was beginning to build in the camps, uh, because the Japanese Americans were heroes all over the world. I mean, they were great. Uh, they were great American soldiers. And then the problems became much, much worse because the old people, it, these people had nothing left. They had nothing to go back to. So the idea of taking them out of the camps and back to California, where they, they felt was impossible. Where they had nothing and where they may well, Dan Inouye, when he went through San Francisco on his way back to Hawaii with a Medal of Honor on his chest, uh, couldn't get his hair cut. We don't cut Jap hair. Uh, and their kids had been taken out of school, although they recreated schools in the camps. The Japanese themselves did. Uh, so it was very tough, particularly getting the younger people tended to take jobs in the Midwest or get into colleges in the Midwest and in New Jersey. The older people were terrified to leave the camps and it took, And they had to be pulled out. They had to be pulled out and put on sealed trains and taken back to California where they then ended up sleeping in churches and Buddhist temples and trailer camps and old prisoner of war camps. Most of them could never put their lives back together again. I mean, the young people, you know, became some of the nation's most prominent citizens, but the old folks, they couldn't handle it. Were reparations ever made? They were made when uh, the survivors in the 1990s, there was an apology from President Ford, who had been a lieutenant commander in the Navy in the war, saying this is one of the worst things and, and we apologize. When Reagan and George H.W. Bush were president, the Congress passed laws 
which gave survivors, you had to be living, of the camps $20,000 $20, in reparations. Many, many of the Japanese tore those checks up because it was a pittance compared to what they had they lost. lost yeah. And many gave them to their neighbors if their neighbors had watched over their property or their houses or whatnot. And then like everything else, you know, we are a people of the present. I mean, the most American of, of excuses or reasons is, well, we have to move on. Let's move on. We don't look back. And I wanted to look back. Do you think there's been any lasting impact on the Japanese American community from that incident of the 1940s? I really don't know, but I do know that wherever I go, dozens, sometimes hundreds, of Japanese Americans come to talk uh, about the book. But they are actually the most intermarried ethnic group now in America. Obviously, they're thriving in the country. They're doctors, they're lawyers, and there is an amazing lack of bitterness as the old generation. The old generation, who wouldn't talk about any of this for 30, 40 years, uh, because they didn't want their, they were ashamed. They didn't want their children to know what they had gone through. Uh, but on balance, I would say no. It, I mean, we're a country where whoever comes, whatever minority, going as far back as the Indians and the slaves, but also the Irish, the Jews, the Eastern Europeans, uh, uh, when they came here, were thought not to be like us until they were us. And they are us now, and I would say the bitterness is gone. They're proud to be Americans. They were proud to be Americans then. They loved the country, and they've moved on. Well, Richard, but what hasn't moved on is that it could happen again. Well, Richard Reeves, thank you so much for being on the program. The book is called Infamy. This has been the Mimi Gerges Show. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll tune in again next time.